Chicago Pile Early on the morning of December 2nd, 1942, two figures crunched over the frozen snow covering the campus of the University of Chicago. It was terribly cold, below zero, remembered Leona Woods, a 23-year-old physics grad student. Walking alongside Woods, hunched against the cold, was the world-famous Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. Woods and Fermi ducked through a gate leading into the football stadium. They nodded to security guards and hurried down a dark hallway beneath the stands, their breath forming frost clouds in the air. It was just as cold inside as out. Under the football stands were a series of unheated squash courts. They opened the door to one of the courts and stepped inside. The scene of this test at the University of Chicago would have been confusing to an outsider, Fermi later said. He would have only seen what appeared to be a crude pile of black bricks. Shaped like an oval, the black pile was about 25 feet wide in the middle and 20 feet high. Woods and Fermi climbed up to a balcony high above the court. The balcony was originally meant for people to watch squash players, said Woods, but now it was filled with control equipment and readout circuits glowing and winking. A young physicist named Herb Anderson walked in, yawning, and helped do a few last-minute checks. Everything was set for one of the most important experiments in the history of science. But first, breakfast. Herb, Fermi, and I went over to the apartment I shared with my sister, Wood said. I made pancakes, mixing the batter so fast that there were bubbles of dry flour in it. When fried, these were somewhat crunchy between the teeth, and Herb thought I'd put nuts in the batter. After the quick meal, the three set out across campus to the football stadium. Back we mushed, said Woods, through the cold, creaking snow. Oppenheimer was busy recruiting scientists for Los Alamos, but that didn't mean he knew for sure an atomic bomb was technically possible. He and the other scientists had spent years studying fission. They knew they could bombard a uranium atom with neutrons and cause its nucleus to split. They knew the splitting nucleus would release energy. But what happened next? Theoretically, as the uranium nucleus split into two, more neutrons would break free and fly off on their own. The speeding neutrons would collide with other uranium atoms, causing them to fission also. As these uranium atoms split, they would release more neutrons, which would hit more uranium atoms. These atoms would also split, releasing still more neutrons, which would hit more uranium atoms, causing more fission, more free-flying neutrons, more fission, more neutrons, and so on. Though they didn't know if it would actually happen, physicists had a name ready for this process, chain reaction. Each splitting atom would release a small amount of energy, so scientists knew that if they could cause a fast enough chain reaction, they might be able to build atomic bombs. But first, they had to prove a chain reaction was even possible. That's what Enrico Fermi and his team were trying to do in the squash court under the football stands in Chicago. The black blocks were graphite, a mineral used to make lead pencils, pencil leads. Slid into holes in some of the blocks were small pieces of uranium. Fermi used graphite to slow down the speeding neutrons. He knew that neutrons would bounce off the carbon atoms that make up graphite and lose speed. Traveling a bit more slowly, they'd be more likely to hit the uranium atoms and cause fission. Stuck through the pile at various points were long wooden poles wrapped with a bluish-white metal called cadmium. Cadmium was chosen for its ability to absorb huge numbers of neutrons. As long as the cadmium poles were in place, they would absorb the neutrons shooting out of the uranium. This, Fermi told Leslie Groves, would prevent a chain reaction from starting. Still, the idea of attempting to release nuclear energy in the middle of a city of three million made Groves very nervous. If the pile should explode, no one knew just how far the danger would extend, Groves fretted. Because of this, I had serious misgivings about the wisdom of doing the experiment there. Fermi assured Groves he knew exactly what he was doing. A little before 10 a.m., Fermi and his team of about 15 students and scientists assembled in the freezing squash court. Most climbed to the balcony, but three stood on an elevated platform near the ceiling, holding buckets full of cadmium. If the reaction got out of control, they were to dump the cadmium on the pile, then get out fast. Fermi sat in a chair on the balcony. He looked over his blinking monitors, then ordered the first cadmium rod to be lifted out of the pile. As the rod went up, Specially built machines measured the flying neutrons, clicking loudly as more and more neutrons were released inside the pile. Fermi did some quick calculations in his notebook. Then he ordered another rod up. The clicking sounds increased again. Fermi did a new set of calculations and called for another rod to be lifted. 
As the experiment continued, more and more curious scientists crammed onto the balcony. Leo Slizzard and Eugene Wigner, the ones who triggered the Manhattan Project by convincing Albert Einstein to warn President Roosevelt of the danger of atomic bombs, came to watch. Everyone was shivering and covered with black graphite dust. No one spoke but Fermi. Only one cadmium rod remained in the pile. Fermi's team called it the Zip Rod. A physicist named George Wheel stood on the floor, holding the rope up that lifted it. Fermi called, Go ahead, George. The rod went up a foot. The clicking increased. Another foot, George. Wheel pulled the rod a bit higher. You could hear the sound of the neutron counter, clickety-clack, clickety-clack, said Herb Anderson. The Underwoods kept her eyes on the monitors, calling out measurements to Fermi. Another foot, George. The rod went up again. The tension in the room rose with the clicking. Only Fermi seemed to be enjoying himself. This will do it, he announced, a confident grin spreading across his face. Now, the pile will chain react. Wheel pulled the rod completely out of the pile. Then the clicks came more and more rapidly, said Anderson. And after a while, they began to merge into a roar. Fermi's smile got bigger. Pile has gone critical, he said. The chain reaction was going and would continue doubling in power every two minutes until he shut it down. Two minutes passed. Fermi watched the monitors but said nothing. Everyone began to wonder why he didn't shut the pile off, Anderson said. The machines continued to roar. Fermi calmly took a few notes. He waited another minute, then another, said Anderson. The anxiety was too much to bear. Finally, Fermi said, Zip in! The cadmium rod dropped back into the pile, followed by the other rods. The clicking machines went quiet. There was a long silence in the squash court. Then, unsure what else to do, everyone began to clap. The controlled release of atomic power has been demonstrated for the first time in history, Fermi said of his experiment. The pilot generated only enough energy to power a small light bulb, but the chain reaction had been proved. Humans now knew they could release the enormous power locked inside atoms. For some time, we had known that we were about to unlock a giant, remembered Eugene Wigner. Still, we could not escape an eerie feeling when we knew we had actually done it. Wigner pulled out a bottle of red wine and a stack of paper cups. He filled the cups, and the scientists and students silently passed them around. No one offered a toast, Leona Woods recalled. There was a greater drama in the silence than if words had been spoken. Woods couldn't be sure what the others were thinking. She had a feeling their thoughts were similar to her own. Of course, the Germans have already made a chain reaction, she said to herself. We have, and they have been ahead until now. Then she thought, when do we get as scared as we ought to be? Operation Gunnerside Newt Halkalid lay in his hospital bed in Britain, recovering from the accidental bullet wound in his foot. He was furious with himself for missing the chance to parachute into Norway, but he was about to get a second chance. In spite of the glider disaster, the British and Americans were still determined to destroy the Vermork heavy water plant in Norway. Like the graphite and Rico Fermi used in a Chicago pile, heavy water can be used to slow down neutrons and create a chain reaction in uranium. In fact, heavy water is more efficient than graphite. Fermi would have used heavy water if he could have gotten his hands on enough, but Adolf Hitler held tight to the world's only supply. Breaking that grip was the key to stopping the German bomb. The Allies could try bombing for Mork from the air, but the cliffside target would be difficult for planes to hit. They'd be more likely to kill civilians during living nearby than to seriously damage the plant. As soon as Haukel had got out of the hospital, he was brought to London with five other Norwegian volunteers for a talk with Colonel John Wilson of the SOE. Wilson explained the new mission, codenamed Gunnerside. The Norwegians would parachute onto the Hardanger Plateau and find Jens Paulsen and his team. They were still camped somewhere on the plateau. Together, they'd ski to Vermork, bust into the building, and blow up vital equipment in the plant basement. Wilson told them about the glider operation. He told them the Nazis had executed every one of the British soldiers. You must reckon, he said, that the Germans will, in no circumstances, take any prisoners. It was not normal procedure to give commandos this kind of information, but Wilson wanted the men going in with no illusions. You have a 50-50 chance of doing the job, Wilson said, and only a fair chance of escaping. On the night of February 17, 1943, 
Newt Haukalid, and the other gunner side men hunched inside a British plane, cruising 10,000 feet above the North Sea. It was a tight fit inside the aircraft, remembered Haukalid. With our heavy equipment, weapons, and thick clothes, we could hardly move. The team had spent weeks preparing for their mission. They studied photographs and technical drawings of the remorque plant. They planned routes in and out of the factory and practiced wrapping explosives around the type of equipment they expected to find inside. They were given cross-country skis, with which they needed no training. And there was one final tool. We were all issued the death pill, Haukalid recalled. Rather than allow themselves to be taken prisoner and tortured for information, the men were instructed to bite this pill. It was cyanide and closed in a rubber cover, said Haukalid. It could be kept in the mouth. Once bitten, though, it would ensure death within three seconds. At one in the morning, the British pilot announced that they were ten minutes from the jump site. The team leader, 22-year-old Joachim Ronenberg, stood over the open hatch in the plane's floor looking down. The drop target was a frozen lake deep in the wilderness, hopefully far from any German patrols. No doubt the hearts of most of us beat a little faster at the thought that we were about to jump into the moonlight over heaven knew what, Halkelid later said. The warning lamp and the roof burned green. All clear. Ronan Bird tum tumbled out first, then the others, and then the crates of equipment. I felt the marvelous jerk which told me that the parachute had opened, said Halkelid. Beneath me there was nothing but snow and ice. Here lay the Hardanger Plateau, the largest, loneliest, and wildest mountain area in northern Europe. Halkelid landed in the snow. The other men in the equipment glided down all around him. He got up and looked around at the low, snow-covered hills dotted with bare bushes. Clearly, they were not on the frozen lake they'd been aiming for. Do you know where we are? asked Ronenberg. Halkelid shook his head. We may be in China for all I know. It was obvious that we had not landed on the lake, Ronenberg recalled. But we didn't have time to worry about that. We had to gather our equipment and stow it away before daylight. The men dragged the equipment crates to a nearby hunting cabin, chopped open the locked door with an axe, and slept in their clothes on the floor. The next day, they set out on skis to find Paulson's team. As snow began falling and the temperature dropped, the men labored up and down the icy slopes. After months in the comparatively warm and flat English countryside, they just weren't in shape for this kind of work. We felt disoriented and feverish, said Ronenberg. Meanwhile, the snowfall was thickening and the wind was increasing. After covering just four miles, the growing storm forced them to turn back toward the cabin. They dove inside, lit a fire, and started scraping the ice off their faces. Then they searched the cabin and got lucky. In a drawer, they found a logbook with the location of the cabin written inside. Now at least they knew where they were. They could set out with confidence when the blizzard let up. It lasted five days. The temperature fell to ten below zero, and fifty-mile-per-hour winds rocked the thin walls. The cabin seemed about to be lifted, said Ronenberg. Then, suddenly, the wind fell and the sky turned bright blue. The men stepped out into a world of blinding white. They quickly gathered their supplies and set out in the direction Paulson and his team should be. That afternoon, they spotted in the distance two men on skis. The gunner side men ducked behind boulders and drew their guns. Ronenberg peeled through his binoculars. They handed them to Haukelid, saying, Do you recognize them? Haukelid took a look. The two figures were 300 yards away and bundled in thick winter coats. The men could be their Norwegian comrades, or they could be Germans on patrol. Deciding he needed to get closer, Haukelid tucked his pistol into his belt. He let the two men pass by his hiding spot, then skied toward them from behind. The wind blew the sound of his skis away from the men ahead of him. Haukelid got within 15 yards, still unnoticed. At this distance, there was no doubt they were skinny from a hungry winter, but these were Klaus Helberg and Arnie Klaustrup, two of Paulson's team. Hackle had stopped. He coughed loudly. Helberg and Kelstrup spun around, pulling out pistols, and were about to fire when they recognized their old international gangster schoolmate. All three men shouted with joy. There was backslapping, Hackle had said of the happy moment, and much strong and hearty cursing. The ten young Norwegians gathered in a nearby cabin to review the job ahead. 
Their target was the Vermork plant, built into the side of a steep 3,000-foot gorge. At the bottom of the gorge was the now-frozen Man River. As you all know, Ronenberg said, our main problem is the approach itself. We have all the necessary equipment and explosives to do the job, but we must reach the target to get the job done. Klaus Helberg had grown up in Rukon, right near the plant, and knew the area as only a native could. There were two ways to get at the place, he said. First, the way everyone went, across a suspension bridge over the gorge. The bridge led right to the plant, but it was patrolled by German soldiers. Shooting the guards will create too much noise before we get inside the building, said Helberg. Option two was to climb down the gorge, cross the river, and come up at the plant from below. We know the Germans don't expect anyone to try that route, Helberg said, because the gorge itself is not patrolled. It's the one weak point in the defense system around the plant, Ronenberg agreed. He divided the men into a five-man demolition party, led by himself, and a five-man covering party, led by Haukelid. Drawing diagrams of the plant buildings, he showed each man where to position himself during the attack. If the factory doors were bolted, he explained, rather than make noise blasting them open, they'd go in through an air duct that led into the main building. There was just enough space for one man at a time to crawl through, he said. If anything should happen to me, or anything should upset the plan, everyone must act on his own with the goal in mind to complete the operation, Ronenberg insisted. In short, if fighting breaks out, everyone must act on his own initiative in order to complete the operation. All were in agreement. Finally, to repeat what we were all told in Britain, added Ronenberg, if any man is wounded or about to be taken prisoner, he ends his own life. All agreed. High Concentration At about eight on the night of February 27, 1943, the Norwegians pulled on white camouflage suits, shouldered their 50-pound sacks, put on skis, and started for Vermork. The weather was overcast, Ronenberg later explained, mild with much wind. They glided down a mountain and into a forest, thick with bushes and low branches. They had to take off their skis and trudge on foot through the wet snow. We sank in the snow up to our waists, Ronenberg said. Klaus Helberg led the way out of the trees and back into the faint moonlight. They put on their skis and continued. Soon, they could hear the low, steady hum of machinery, the Vermork plant. When they came near the edge of the gorge, they could see it. The great seven-story factory building bulked large on the landscape, Hacklid later said. The Colossus lay like a medieval castle, built in its most inaccessible place, protected by precipices and rivers. They slid downhill toward a long road running along the top of the gorge. They were about to cross when the flash of headlights suddenly lit the snow at their feet. The men dove away from the road as two buses rounded a curve and sped past, carrying night shift workers to Vermork. At about 10 o'clock, they reached the spot from which they would descend into the gorge. In silence, they took off their skis and hid them under pine trees. They removed their white camouflage suits, revealing British military uniforms. They wanted the Germans to know they were soldiers on an official Allied mission. That way, hopefully, the Germans wouldn't retaliate against Norwegian civilians in nearby towns. Then, they started down the gorge. Hanging from the branches of trees growing out of the rocky gorge face, the men slid and tumbled down toward the river. As they got closer, they saw big cracks in the melting river ice and areas of free-flowing water. They stepped lightly across, splashing through three inches of water sitting atop the slushy surface. When they reached the far side, each man lifted an arm and grabbed a rock on the steep gorge wall. With his hand, Ronenberg gave the go signal. The men pulled themselves up the 600-foot rock face, inch by inch. With hands and feet, they felt for tree branches or cracks in the rock. When the fiery pain in their muscles became unbearable, they clung to the side of the cliff and rested, thinking of what their trainers in Britain had taught them. Never look down. A few minutes before midnight, all ten men reached a ledge just below the plant. They gathered, panting and sweating, and waiting a few minutes for their hearts to stop pounding. All right, men, said Ronenberg. Let's get closer. The covering party, commanded by Newt Haukelid, led the way to a storage shed 500 yards from the plant. 
the war of machines covered the slap of their boots on the wet snow. From behind the shed, the men looked out at the suspension bridge leading across the gorge. Two German guards, holding rifles, paced the narrow bridge. They never looked toward the gorge, assuming no one could come that way. The team dashed toward an iron fence surrounding the plant. There was a gate locked with a chain and padlock. Haukelin and Arnie Klaustrup ran ahead with heavy wire cutters, cut through the chain, and swung the gate open. Haukelin, Klaustrup, and the rest of the covering party went in first, taking assigned positions around the outside of the plant. Then the demolition team raced in. The hum of the machinery was steady and normal, said Roneberg. There was a good light from the moon, and no one in sight except our own men. Roneberg led the team to the door of the plant nearest to their target, the high concentration room in which the heavy water equipment did its work. He tried the door. Locked, he whispered. The plant's windows were covered with black paint, blocking light from escaping and making the building nearly invisible to enemy bombers. Roneberg put his face to the glass. Through thin scratches in the paint, he could see down to the high concentration room. A single Norwegian worker sat at a desk writing in a book. Roneberg sent three team members to try the other doors while he and Frederick Kaser started looking for the air duct. Here it is, he whispered. Roneberg climbed in first. The space was too narrow for him to turn and look back, but he knew Kaser was behind him. He could hear the man's breathing. Flashlight in hand, Roneberg crawled through the duct. From studying technical drawings of the plant, he knew he had about 30 yards to go. Suddenly, he was startled by a loud metallic crack. A pistol had dropped from Kaser's belt and smacked the duct floor. Both men froze. Through seams in the duct, they could see the Norwegian worker at his desk. He never looked up from his book. Reaching an inner hallway, Roneberg removed a crate covering an opening in the duct. He and Kaser lowered themselves to the floor. Drawing their pistols, they tiptoed to the door of the high concentration room. A sign on the door read, No admittance except on business. Roneberg smiled. He reached for the doorknob. The door was unlocked. The Norwegian workman looked up from his notebook as Roneberg and Kaser opened the door. On your feet! Hands up! shouted Kaser, pointing his gun. Nothing will happen if you do as you're told. Roneberg set down his pack and began pulling out snake-shaped explosive charges, each about a foot long. He put on rubber gloves to prevent static electricity from jumping from his skin to the fuses. Then he looked over the 18 heavy water machines. They looked exactly like the ones he trained on back in Britain. Roneberg had wrapped charges around half the machines when the sound of shattering glass broke his focus. He turned toward a window high up on the wall. Peering down through the window frame was the face of Berger Stromsheim, part of the demolition party. Stromsheim had been unable to find the air duct. Knowing the smashing sound could have alerted the German guards, Roneberg quickly pulled pieces of broken glass from the frame, slicing open his hand. He wrapped a handkerchief around the gash as Stromsheim climbed down into the room. Together, the two set the remaining charges and connected them to a single 30-second fuse. All right, Roneberg said, blood dripping from his hand as he pointed to the right worker, to the night worker. Let's get that door to the yard unlocked. The night worker put a key in the lock and turned it. Kaser reached forward and opened the door crack just to make sure. It's not that I don't trust you, he said. I'm just not allowed to trust anybody. I understand, said the worker. Roneberg struck a match and held it to the fuse. Wait, please, cried the night worker. My eyeglasses, they're on the table. I need them for my job. They're almost impossible to replace these days. Cringing, Runeberg blew out the match. He hurried to the desk, picked up the man's glasses case, and threw it to him. He lit another match and bent toward the fuse. I beg you, wait, shouted the worker. My glasses, they are not in the case. Biting back fury, Roneberg blew out the second match. Where are your damn glasses? The worker pointed to the desk. Roneberg ran back over, shuffled through the papers, found them, and handed them to the man. A thousand thanks, said the worker. Roneberg lit a third match and held it to the fuse. Go, he shouted. Run, run as fast as you can. The time seemed long to us who stood waiting outside, remembered Newt Haukelid. We knew that the blowing up party was inside, carrying out its part of the task, but we did not know how things were going. 
Hagelin held a pistol and grenades. Next to him stood Jens Paulson with his finger on the trigger of a machine gun. We could be holding them up, Paulson whispered. I wish I knew. Then it came, the sound of an explosion. The windows around the high concentration room blew out. They felt a rush of air race past them. The door of the German soldier's barracks opened and a soldier stepped out with a rifle in one hand and a flashlight in the other. Shall I fire? asked Paulson. Not yet, said Halkalid. The soldier swung his light across the snowy ground around the plant. Halkalid and Paulson stood with their backs flat against a shed just out of view. The soldier turned back toward the barracks. Ronenberg and the demolition, te demolition team came racing toward Halkalid. Together, they ran out the open gate and gathered about 300 yards from the fence. The Germans still don't seem to know what's happened, Halkalid said. All ten men scrambled down the gorge. They slid from one wet icy rock to another, resting briefly on thin ledges, then continuing the slippery descent. At the bottom of the gorge, the ice on the river had continued melting. Big chunks were now spinning in the rushing black water. The men were leaping from chunk to chunk when the scream of Vermork's sirens ripped through the air. It was as if we were being pursued across the river by the shrieking sound itself, Romberg reported. We slipped and fell, grabbing onto the rocks and blocks of ice. They made it across and immediately started up the far side of the gorge. They reached the top and ducked back down just as a car raced past on the road in front of them. Then they crossed the road, found their skis and poles, jumped into their white camouflage suits, and sped across the snow away from the road. German cars and trucks kept zipping past us, remembered Jens Paulsen. That was all to the good. Those Nazis were in too much of a hurry to get to Vormork and look to look right or left as they raced along. The gunner side team split up, most heading on skis to the Swedish border, 250 miles to the northeast. Newt Haukelid and Arne Klellstrup stayed behind in Norway to help organize the anti-German resistance. They skied to a mountain hut, found radio equipment that had been stashed by other resistance fighters, and wrote out a short, coded message for London. High concentration installation at Vormork completely destroyed on the night of 2728. Gunnerside has gone to Sweden. Then they headed deeper into the wilderness. You can bet the Germans are in a fury, Halkel had told Klaustrup, and you can bet that they'll search every corner of the mountains. Only later did Haukula learn how right he was. Enraged German commanders were already sending out a 10,000-man German force to track down the saboteurs. Not a single one of the Norwegians was ever caught. Part 3. How to Build an Atomic Bomb The Gatekeeper One afternoon in late March 1943, Delory McKibben, a 45-year-old single mother was crossing the street in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Halfway across, she ran into Joe Stevenson, a local businessman she knew casually. There were no cars coming, so they talked in the street. How would you like a job as a secretary? asked Stevenson, who'd heard McKibben was looking for work. Secretary to what? she wanted to know. He smiled. Secretary, he said. She knew he was doing something for the government, something to do with the war. Well, what would I do? she asked. You would be a secretary, he said. Don't you know what a secretary does? Not always. Well, think it over. I'll give you 24 hours. Intrigued, McKibben agreed to meet her potential employer the next day in the lobby of La Fonda, the nicest hotel in town. She was standing there, waiting, when she saw a man enter. He wore a trench coat. He had wiry black hair and bright blue eyes. He strode directly to her and introduced himself as Mr. Bradley. Then he fired quick questions about her background, her skills, her knowledge of Santa Fe. As she answered, he leaned forward and stared intensely at her. I never met a person with a magnetism that hit you so fast and so completely, she said later. She had no idea who this man was or what he was doing in town. She didn't care. I knew anything he was connected with would be alive, she said. I thought to be associated with that person, whoever he was, be simply great. She took the job. When she reported for work the next day, the man was waiting for her. Only when they got inside and closed the door did he tell her that his real name was Robert Oppenheimer. A week later, confused scientists began showing up in Santa Fe. 
wandering the streets holding a letter that read, Go to 109 East Palace Avenue, Santa Fe, New Mexico. There you will find out how to complete your trip. Friendly locals directed the strangers to an ancient wrought iron gate that opened onto a courtyard built by Spanish settlers in the 1600s. In one of the buildings surrounding the courtyard was a door marked with the number 109. When newcomers knocked, they were greeted by Dorothy McKibben, the gatekeeper, as she quickly became known. They arrived, breathless and sleepless and haggard, tired from riding on trains that were slow, she remembered. The new members were tense with expectancy and curiosity. Those were the ones who found the address. McKibben often got calls from nearby drugstores that began, There is a party here who is lost. She'd say, Send him over right away. In a small office crammed with desks and boxes, McKibben wrote out security passes for the scientists. She told them that, from now on, their mailing address was Post Office Box 1663, Santa Fe, New Mexico. To avoid drawing attention to the arrival of so many scientists, she cautioned them never to refer to each other as doctor or professor while in town. Then she gave them directions to Los Alamos. Scientists continued arriving throughout April. The office was a madhouse, said McKibben. Famous physicists were given code names, Enrico Fermi, for example, who was supposed to tell people his name was Henry Farmer. But Fermi had a hard time remembering his new name and felt absurd pronouncing it with his thick Italian accent. Like Fermi, much of Oppenheimer's scientific dream team was European, many of them Jews who had escaped from Hitler. This gave America a huge advantage in its race with Germany, but it also presented a security problem. The people of Santa Fe, a city of just 20,000, began to wonder why so many men with European accents were suddenly walking the streets. And there were other clues that something was going on. Long lines of army trucks were seen driving up the narrow road to Los Alamos. They always went up the hill loaded. They always came back empty. Some amazing rumors began to circulate through Santa Fe, remembered Leslie Groves. Some guessed that Los Alamos housed a secret military project. They were make, making submarines, according to one rumor, death rays, according to another. Others claimed Los Alamos was home for pregnant military personnel or possibly a nudist colony. The crazier the rumors got, the more they worried Groves and Oppenheimer. Up on the hill, as Los Alamos became known to its residents, Oppenheimer asked Charlotte Serber to step into his office. He needed her help, he told her. Charlotte was married to Robert Serber, the physicist and former student who'd become Oppenheimer's right-hand man the year before. Oppenheimer knew Robert and Charlotte well. He trusted them completely. The rumors in Santa Fe were getting wilder and wilder, Oppenheimer told Serber. The danger was that, sooner or later, someone might stumble onto the truth, and the story could spread. And if the Germans learned how seriously the Americans were working on an atomic bomb, they'd surely double their own efforts. Oppenheimer's solution was to plant a false, but believable, story about what was happening at Los Alamos. Therefore, he told Serber, for Santa Fe purposes, we are making an electric rocket. Charlotte Serber was unsure what this had to do with her. Go to Santa Fe, Oppenheimer continued. Talk. Talk too much. Talk as if you had too many drinks. Get people to eavesdrop. Say a number of things about us that are not, you are not supposed to. Finally, I don't care how you manage it. Say we are building an electric rocket. Charlotte explained the mission to her husband, and they drove from Los Alamos to Santa Fe. They walked into the bar at La Fonda at about 9 p.m., sat at a table, and ordered drinks. Our conversation was singularly dull as we each wondered about how to bring electric rockets into it, Charlotte recalled. We told little stories about Los Alamos, mentioning the forbidden name boldly and loudly, but no ears cocked in our direction. Unable to attract attention, they walked down the street to Joe King's Blue Ribbon Bar, which Robert described as jumping, jammed, and crowded. A young man immediately approached Charlotte, bowed, and asked for her to dance. She agreed. While they danced, she got the conversation started by asking if he lived in Santa Fe. Yes, he said. What do you do? she asked. Nothing. How come you're not in the service? 4F, he said, a military classification for those physically unfit for service. Want to get a job on a ranch? We're up at Los Alamos, she said, teetering toward the target. Uh-huh. It's quite a place, don't you think? She asked. So mysterious and secret. Yeah, he shrugged. You know, I sure want to run a ranch someday. But what do you suppose they're doing at Los Alamos? 
I don't know, he said. Come to town often? You sure dance fine. We come to town as often as we can, but they don't like us to get out much. What's your guess about what cooks up there? Beats me. Don't care. May I have another dance with you later? Robert Serber watched it all from a booth near the dance floor. Seeing that things were going badly for his wife, he walked up to the tightly packed bar, turned toward the man next to him, grabbed the lapels of his jacket, and shouted, Do you know what we're doing at Los Alamos? We're building an electric rocket! The man grunted and sipped his drink. Driving back to Los Alamos that night, the Serbers knew their mission had failed. The FBI and Army intelligence never reported picking up any rumors about electric rockets, Robert said. The spy business isn't as easy as it appears in the movies. And so, the rumors in Santa Fe kept flying. Something big was obviously going on, and locals wondered if jobs might be available. Almost every day, someone knocked on the door at 109 East Palace and asked Dorothy McKibben for work on the new government project in town. I can't understand wherever you got that idea, said the smiling gatekeeper. There's nothing of that sort in Santa Fe that we know of. The Gadget On the evening of April 15, 1943, about 40 physicists gathered in what used to be the library reading room of the Los Alamos Ranch School. A small blackboard on wheels stood at one end of the room. In front of the blackboard were several rows of folding chairs. Everyone took seats, except for Robert Oppenheimer and his assistant, Robert Serber. Buildings were still under construction, remembered Serber. There was a hammering off in the background, carpenters and electricians working out of sight, but all over the place. Oppenheimer introduced, introduced Serber and sat down. Serber looked down at his notes and began reading quietly with a slight stutter, but he opened with a bang. The object of the project is to produce a practical military weapon in the form of a bomb in which the energy is released by fast neutron chain reaction. There was a second of stunned silence. Until that moment, many in the room had not known exactly why they'd been dragged into this remote mountaintop. Scribbling graphs and formulas on the blackboard as he spoke, Serber began to explain the physics of an atomic bomb. He wasn't much of a speaker, the physicist Isidore Raby recalled, but for ammunition, he had everything Oppenheimer's theoretical group had uncovered during the last year. He knew it all cold, and that was all he cared about. Serber had the room's attention, until a sharp crack interrupted the talk. Startled, everyone looked up. They saw a jagged hole in the thin ceiling above, and dangling through the hole, a wiggling leg of an electrician. The scientists heard the man call for help. They heard men running up to the floor above, then saw the leg slowly slide up through the hole and disappear. Serbert returned to his lecture. Almost every sentence included the word bomb, which began to worry Oppenheimer. He leaned to the physicist beside him, John Manley, and whispered something. Manley walked up to Serber and told him to stop saying bomb. There were too many workers around. When Serber resumed his talk, he referred instead to the gadget. The name stuck. Around Los Alamos after that, explained Serber, we called the bomb we were building the gadget. In four more lectures over the next two weeks, Serber described the physics of how the gadget might work. Enrico Fermi's Chicago experiment had proved it was possible to spark a chain reaction in uranium. Fermi's uranium and graphite pile had released energy, but only a tiny amount, and slowly. The problem facing Oppenheimer's team was to figure out how to create a much faster chain reaction that would release so much energy it would cause a massive explosion, and the whole thing had to be light enough to travel by airplane. In theory, Serber explained, the design of the bomb could be very simple. They could load two pieces of very pure uranium into a specially adapted artillery gun. Inside the gun barrel, they would fire one piece of uranium at the other. When the two pieces met, they would form a critical mass, the amount of material needed to get a chain reaction going. The reaction would begin, speeding neutrons would hit uranium atoms, which would split, releasing energy and more neutrons. Each fission would release just enough energy to move a grain of sand. But within less than one millionth of a second, so many atoms would fission that the lump of uranium would blow itself apart with a force of millions of pounds of regular explosive. Serber drew a rough sketch of what became known as the gun assembly method. Surrounding the uranium would be a tamper, a tamper, a shield of very dense metal. The tamper would prevent flying neutrons from escaping, bouncing them instead back into the uranium. This would cause more fission and a bigger explosion. Major questions remained, Serber told the team. Exactly how much uranium was needed to form a critical mass? 
what material would perform best as a tamper? How fast would the lumps of uranium need to be brought together inside the gun? How big an explosion would this type of bomb cause? And of course, would this design even work? We started working immediately, said Richard Feynman. Outside the workrooms, Los Alamos was a disaster. The site itself was a mess, said Robert Serber. It was in shambles, agreed Hans Baith. It was a construction site. You stumbled over kegs of nails, over posts, over ladders. Melting snow sank into the dirt roads, turning to sticky black mud. And while views of the surrounding mountains and deserts were spectacular, the army built high fences around the entire lab, making the scientists feel like prisoners. The first thing I noticed, remembered Edward Teller, was that we were all going to be locked up together for better or worse. I was shocked by the isolation, isolation, Baith said. Clearly, we were very far from anything, very far from anybody. Oppenheimer and his wife moved into one of the five log cabins that had originally been built for the school directors, a little group of houses known as Bathtub Row. They had the only tubs on the hill. Younger scientists crowded into bunk beds in an old school building while new dorms were being built. Bob Christie and his wife had to go to the bathroom through our bedroom, recalled Feynman, so that was very uncomfortable. As construction continued, Oppenheimer was often seen strolling the streets of his growing town in jeans and a western shirt, his thumbs tucked into his belt. New scientists were arriving all the time, and when the director saw someone he didn't know, he'd stride up to the newcomer. Welcome to Los Alamos, he'd say, smiling. And who the devil are you? To get to work, scientists struggled through the mud to the half-finished tech area, which housed labs and offices and was surrounded by another fence, nine feet high, with barbed wire strung along the top. Military police guarded the only gate 24 hours a day. To gain entrance, scientists had to show their white badges. Only the scientists were issued these special photo IDs. Oppenheimer arrived at the gate of the tech area each morning at 7.30, flashed his white badge, and walked to his office. This was a big change from his Berkeley days. A lover of late-night parties, he'd never scheduled classes before 11 a.m. But Oppenheimer knew that it wasn't just his reputation and career on the line at Los Alamos. It was the outcome of the biggest war in human history. And in case the pressure wasn't intense enough, President Roosevelt spelled it out in a personal note. Whatever the enemy may be planning, American science will be equal to the challenge, Roosevelt wrote to Oppenheimer. With this thought in mind, I send this note of confidence and appreciation. Oppenheimer thanked Roosevelt for the kind words, adding, There will be many times in the months ahead when we shall remember them. Then a memo came from General Leslie Groves. Given Oppenheimer's vital importance to the country, wrote Groves, it is requested that A. You refrain from flying in airplanes of any description. The time saved is not worth the risk. B. You refrain from driving in an automobile for any appreciable distance above a few miles, and from being without suitable protection on any lonely road. C. In driving about town, a guard of some kind should be used, particularly during hours of darkness. These were sensible precautions, but the truth is that Groves had more than safety on his mind. Many of Groves' intelligence officers still didn't trust the Los Alamos director. They believed he was secretly a communist and perhaps even in touch with Soviet agents, they wanted him under constant surveillance. Army Counterintelligence Corps, CIC, agents hid microphones in Oppenheimer's office. They listened in on his phone calls and read his mail. Even Oppenheimer's personal driver and bodyguard, the one Groves insisted he have, was actually an undercover agent. Oppenheimer sensed he was being watched, but he never guessed how closely. On June 12th, he traveled to Berkeley to recruit more brains for Los Alamos. CIC agents followed him every step of the way. Laboratory Number Two By early 1943, the Soviet army had finally halted the massive German invasion just short of the Soviet cities of Stalingrad, Moscow, and Leningrad. The greatest military achievement in all history, praised Douglas MacArthur, a top American general. But the fighting raged on, with some of the biggest battles in the history of the war taking place on the blood-soaked Soviet soil that spring. Joseph Stalin, the Soviet premier, called desperately for the Americans and British to launch an invasion of German-held Western Europe. This would force Hitler to fight on two fronts, taking pressure off the Soviets. President Franklin Roosevelt and Bri British Prime Minister Winston Churchill 
told, it, told Stalin it was coming. American and British troops were just beginning their attack on Germany's ally, Italy, and American forces were locked in ferocious battles with Japan all over the Pacific. A major invasion of Western Europe was still a year away. Americans continued shipping weapons to the Soviets, but the atomic bomb remained secret. In fact, Roosevelt and Churchill signed a special agreement vowing to keep it that way. It was the job of Army counterintelligence to guard the world's most dangerous secret, not just from the Germans, but from the Soviets as well. So CIC officers were determined to investigate any suspicious behavior, especially when it came from the director of Los Alamos. On June 16th, CIC agents tailed Oppenheimer onto a train heading for Berkeley to Sa- from Berkeley to San Francisco. At the San Francisco station, they watched as Oppenheimer was greeted by a tall woman with dark hair. They recognized her as Jean Tatlock, a former girlfriend of Oppenheimer's and a member of the Communist Party. Oppenheimer and Tatlock walked arm in arm to Tatlock's car, got in, and drove off. The agents followed the car to a Mexican restaurant in San Francisco. Oppenheimer and Tatlock went inside, had dinner and drinks, then drove to her apartment and entered together. The agents sat in their car, watching the windows. Tatlock's lights went out at 11.30. Oppenheimer was not observed until 8.30 a.m. next day, the agents reported, when he and Jean Tatlock left the building together. The agents sent their report to Lieutenant Colonel Boris Pash, the top Army intelligence officer on the West Coast. He'd already suspected Oppenheimer of disloyalty. Now, he was seriously alarmed. Pash reported to General Grove's office in Washington, D.C., suggesting that the subject still is or may be connected with the Communist Party. Bash believed that Oppenheimer was either handing secrets directly to the Soviets, or he may be making that information available to his other contacts, Gene Tatlock, for instance. Bash strongly recommended that Oppenheimer be removed completely from the project and dismissed from employment by the U.S. government. Groves refused. He had no idea what Oppenheimer and Tatlock had been up to in her apartment. He didn't want to know. He trusted Oppenheimer's loyalty. Besides, his number one worry was to build an atomic bomb before Hitler did. For this, he said, Oppenheimer was irreplaceable. If anything happens to Oppenheimer, he added, the project will be set back at least six months. Groves' word was final. But if Army counterintelligence couldn't get rid of Oppenheimer, they could certainly let him know how they felt. In the future, please avoid seeing your questionable friends, Colonel Kenneth Nichols told Oppenheimer. And remember, whenever you leave Los Alamos, we will be tailing you. This frightened Oppenheimer. He had no idea how long intelligence agents had been following him or what they already knew about his private life. Suddenly worried about losing his position at Los Alamos, he decided to tell Colonel Pash about the time, six months earlier, that his friend, Hakon Chavalier, had approached him about sharing information with the Soviets. Oppenheimer repeated the brief conversation he'd had with Chevalier. He assured Pash the subject did not come up again. Oppenheimer hoped this confession would convince Pash of his loyalty. Instead, Pash was more suspicious than ever. Had the Chevalier meeting really been that innocent? Pash wondered. If so, why did Oppenheimer wait so long to tell us about it? Pash dashed off another memo to Groves, this time accusing Oppenheimer of playing a key part in the attempts of the Soviet Union to secure, by espionage, highly secret information which is vital to the security of the United States. Again, Groves defended the man he'd chosen. Army counterintelligence and the FBI still believed Oppenheimer was sneaking information to the Soviets. There's no evidence that he was. Soviet memos and cables from the time show that the KGB never gave up hope of cultivating Oppenheimer, but never made any progress either. Meanwhile, the Soviet atomic bomb project was moving ahead. In mid-1943, the Soviet government established Laboratory No. 2, a secret lab in the pine woods outside Moscow. The job of building the Soviet bomb was put in the hands of a 40-year-old physicist named Igor Kurchatov. With resources short during wartime, Kurchatov and his team badly needed help from Soviet spies. Intelligence was still coming in from Klaus Fuchs in Britain, and it was good stuff. The material as a whole, reported Kurchatov, shows that it is technically possible to solve the entire uranium problem in a much shorter period than our scientists believed. But what Kurchatov really needed was specific information on bomb design, and there was only one place to get it. It is extremely important, he said, to receive detailed technical material on this problem from America. 
In Moscow, KGB officers were intensely frustrated by how little they'd uncovered about the Mon Manhattan Project. In the presence of this research work, Moscow cabled its spies in America, vast both in scale and scope, being conducted right here next to you, the slow pace of agent cultivation in the USA is particularly intolerable. What exactly were the Americans doing? The Soviets would never know, not until the KGB could get a scientist inside the Manhattan Project. Then, in late 1943, the KGB got its first big break. It happened because the work at Los Alamos was proving even more difficult than Oppenheimer had expected. He needed more talent, and fast. The British government agreed to send Oppenheimer a team of top physicists. In November, Klaus Fuchs sailed for America. A few weeks later, Harry Gold got a call from his KBG contact, Semyon Semenoyev. Gold was needed in New York City right away. Gold hurried to the meeting place, a dark restaurant. He saw right away that Sam was extremely excited, more so than I had ever seen him before. Gold asked if this had something to do with the industrial spies he'd been picking up information from over the past couple of years. Forget them, Semenoyev said. Forget everything you knew about them. You are never to see them or meet them or have anything to do with them again. Gold was too stunned to respond. Something has come up, the Russian continued, and it is so big and so tremendous that you have got to exert your complete efforts to carrying it through successfully. You have got to concentrate on it completely. Before you make a single move in connection with this, you are to think. Think twice, think three times. You cannot make any mistakes. Ferry job. For months after the attack on the heavy water plant at Vermork, Dut Haukelid stayed hidden in the mountains of Norway. It was an uncommonly hard winter, he said later, with vast amounts of snow. German troops swarmed the area in search of the saboteurs. Haukelid and Arne Klaustrup managed to stay a step ahead of them, but game was scarce in the barren, snowy mountains. Cold weather causes the body to burn calories quickly in an attempt to create heat. Haukelid and Klaustrup simply couldn't find the calories. One day, I managed to kill a squirrel with my skiing stick, remembered Halkalid. When I ate him, he was just as miserably thin and undernourished as we were. They starved through winter and into, sp into spring, dodging German patrols, waiting for their next job. When this war is over, said Killstrip, after yet another unsatisfying meal, I shall spend all my money on food. I shan't spend any on girls. Halkalid licked his long-since empty spoon. Same here, he said. From his office in Washington, D.C., General Leslie Groves followed the news from Norway. The first reports on this action were most encouraging, said Groves of the Gunnerside raid. The heavy water equipment had been destroyed, dealing a serious blow to German bomb research. But by the summer of 1943, things had changed. Sources inside the Vermwerk plant, Norwegian workers who fed information to the resistance network, reported that the Germans were furiously rebuilding the equipment. In August, Vermork again began shipping heavy water to Germany under heavy guard. Groves was alarmed. If the Germans wanted heavy water that badly, he figured, they must be using it in their atomic bomb program. The supply must be cut off. Just before noon on November 16th, about 100 U.S. Air Force bombers appeared two miles above the Vermork plant. Prepared for an air raid, German soldiers turned on smoke machines, which clouded the blue sky. The bombers released 700 bombs into the gorge on which the Vermork plant was perched. The 500-pound bombs exploded all over the gorge and the nearby town of Rujikatan. One, one hit a bomb shelter, killing 16 Norwegians. Several landed around Vermork, with just two hitting the heavy water plant. The high concentration room, deep in the basement of the steel and concrete structure, was unscratched. Yet the bombing was a success in an unexpected way. German authorities realized their precious heavy water would never be safe in Norway. In early February 1944, more news reached London and Washington. The Germans were beginning to empty the heavy water machines. All the heavy water, far more than had ever been shipped before, was being loaded into barrels. Very soon it would be taken to Germany. Groves demanded that those barrels be stopped before reaching German soil. British intelligence gave the job to the man in Norway with the most experience in sabotage. Newt Haukelid. Haukelid enlisted the help of another underground fighter, Ralph Sorley. In need of much more information, the two snuck into Rukatan, the town near the Vermork plant. In the dark street, 
they met Kel Nielsen, an engineer at the plant and a man they knew could be trusted. Hauklid was awful to look at, Nielsen later said, with a dense beard and marked by the tough life in the mountains. They hurried to Nielsen's rented room and went inside to talk. Yes, Nielsen confirmed, about 40 large barrels were being filled with heavy water. In a few days, they'd be loaded onto railway cars and taken by train from the plant. At Lake Tin, the rail cars would slide onto a ferry boat for the trip down the long, narrow waterway. Then, the cars would continue by rail to the coast, where the barrels would be transferred to a ship and taken across the North Sea to Germany. The Germans knew an attack was likely. The barrels would travel under heavy guard, and German planes would fly overhead to watch the land on either side of the tracks. Haukel had relayed the details to British intelligence in London, saying that the job would be tricky and might result in the loss of civilian lives. Case considered, came the re immediate reply from London. Very urgent that heavy water be destroyed. Hope this can be done without too serious consequences. Send our best wishes for good luck in the work. Hauklid gave Sorley a quick course in sabotage and explosives. In the need of a third man for the job, they recruited Newt Lear Hansen, a surveyor who lived in Rukatan. Uh, a tough young fellow who did not know what nerves meant, was how Sorley described Lear's Hansen. Seldom have I seen anyone become so enthusiastic at the prospect of being involved in an action that might be dangerous. In a series of secret meetings, each in a different location, the three men reviewed their options. One was to try another gunner-side-style commando raid. This was unlikely to succeed, since the Germans now had extra soldiers on patrol. If Hauklid could gather a trained crew of 20 or 30, he'd give it a try. But the time was too short for that, he said. Another option was to lay dynamite on the track and blow up the train somewhere along the route. But they could plant the char could they plant the charges without being spotted? What if the Germans sent scouts ahead of the train to inspect the rails? Would the explosion be certain to destroy the heavy water? There were so many unknown factors that we had to give up the plan, said Halkalid. They went over the route again. They spotted the weak link. At Lake Tin, the train cars would be loaded onto a ferry boat. If they could sink the boat over the deepest part of the lake, the barrels of heavy water would come to rest 1,300 feet below the surface. The Vermork engineer, Kel Nielsen, got Halkalid the word. The shipment would be traveling in a few days, Sunday morning, February 20th. Halkalid dressed as a workman and walked around the docks on Lake Tin. He found out that the boat called the Hydro would be used Sunday morning. He bought a ticket and traveled down the lake on Hydro, leaning over the rail with one eye on the minute hand of his watch. Thirty minutes after leaving the dock, the boat would be over the deepest part of the lake. At 1 a.m. on February 20th, Lears Hansen parked his car under a clump of trees about a mile from the ferry dock. He cut the headlights, and he, Haukalid, and Sorley got out and started toward the water with guns, grenades, and explosives hidden under their long coats. The bitter cold nights and everything creaking and crackling were called Haukalid. The ice on the road snapped sharply as we went over it. They saw the hydro tied up at the dark dock. From scouting the area, they knew they were about, there were about 30 German guards at the nearby railway station. There was no one guarding the waterfront. The men hurried along the dock and jumped onto the boat. Sounds of shouting and laughing rose from the crew's quarters below deck. Almost the entire ship's crew was gathered together below, Haukel had said, playing poker rather noisily. Hauklid led the way down the ladders to a hatch leading to the bilge, the ship's lowest compartment. As he opened the hatch, he heard footsteps approaching. The men dove behind chairs as the Norwegian night watchman wa walked up. Lears Hansen recognized the watchman and stepped out. You hear, Newt? asked the startled guard. Yes, John, said Lears Hansen, with some friends. Hauklid and Sorley stepped out from their hiding places. The guard looked them over. Hell, John, we're expecting a raid, Lears Hansen improvised, hoping the guard would assume they needed to hide supplies from the Germans and hoping he'd sympathize. The guard pointed to the hatch leading to the bilge and said, No problem. Lears Hansen stayed above, chatting with the guard, while Hauklid and Sorley climbed into the bilge. It was an anxious job, Hauklid remembered, and it took time. Through the freezing, foot-deep water sloshing around the ship's bottom, they crawled to the front of the ferry, Blowing a hole here they knew would cause water to rush in. The front of the boat would sink, forcing the back to rise out of the lake. The ship's propeller would spin uselessly in the air. 
Kalkulid pulled the bomb out from under his long coat, 19 pounds of plastic explosive molded into a long sausage shape. He and Sorley taped it to the ship's metal side. Near the explosive, they taped two specially adapted alarm clocks, two, just in case one malfunctioned. The clocks were connected by wire to four flashlight batteries. Then came the dangerous part, connecting the fuse between the clocks and the explosive. Each clock had a little metal hammer that rang its alarm bell. The bells had been removed, but the hammers were still in place. When the hammer hit a metal plate on the clock, electricity would flow from the batteries through the clocks to the fuses, igniting the explosive. Each bell hammer was set just one-third of an inch above the metal plate. There was a one-third of an inch between us and disaster, said Halkalid. Halkalid wound the clocks. He set the alarms to ring at 10.45. He and Sorley could hear the clocks ticking away as they scurried back toward the hatch. They passed the guard again on their way off the ship. The man was curious about why they'd taken so long to hide supplies. He showed no sign. You on watch now? Halkalid asked casually. Yes, said the guard. But I go off when the train arrives. Halkalid smiled and said, Lucky man. A few hours later, German soldiers lashed flat train cars carrying 40 barrels of heavy water to the deck of the hydro. The ferry pulled away from the dock at 10.15, right on time. There were 53 people aboard, about half of them Norwegian civilians. For the first half hour, the lake, lake crossing was routine. The captain was on the bridge enjoying a cold, clear morning when he heard the explosion. He knew right away it was a bomb. The ferry tipped forward. The flat cars rolled down the deck, snapped the ropes holding them in place, crashed into the water, and vanished. Terrified and screaming, civilians and German soldiers tumbled and leaped into the icy water, grabbing for chairs, oars, and life vests. The captain saw there was nothing he could do. I jumped into the water and swam about 15 feet from the ship, he said later. By then, the stern was very high and the propeller was still turning. Just four minutes from the moment of explosion, it was all over. She went down, recalled the captain, bow first in the deepest part of the lake. Dirty Work The next day, Newt Lears Hansen showed up for work in Rukatikan, like it was normal Monday morning. Rolf Sorley skied back into the mountains and disappeared. Duke Haukalid took a train to the capital city of Oslo. If anything had gone wrong with the ferry job, his mission was to try again to destroy the heavy water before it sailed for Germany. On a busy Oslo street, Haukalid stopped at a newsstand. It was front-page news in every paper. Railway ferry, hydro sunk. He bought a paper and read. The wrecked ferry lay 1,300 feet below the lake's surface. A rescue boat pulled 27 people from the water. 26, many of the Norwegian civilians, went down with the ferry. The paper said nothing, knew nothing, about the ferry's cargo. How could it slip across the border to Sweden, beyond the reach of the German search for the ferry saboteurs? In the capital city of Stockholm, he took warm baths and put on clean clothes and ate in brightly lit restaurants. But he was in no mood for such luxuries. I was thoroughly tired of being there, he said and longed to get back to the mountains and our comrades in Norway. Halklet skied back across the border and rejoined the resistance. He would continue battling the German army until the end of the war. Leslie Groves was pleased by the news from Norway. Pleased, but not satisfied. Yes, he'd managed to deny key material to the Germans, but the bottom line was this. He still had no idea what was going on inside German weapons labs. We were truly in the dark then about their progress in atomic development. Groves later said. The biggest danger, Groves figured, came from world-class German physicists. Unless and until we had positive knowledge to the contrary, he explained, we had to assume that the most competent German scientists and engineers were working on an atomic problem with the full support of their government. Groves talked it over with Oppenheimer and other scientists at Los Alamos, many of whom had studied and worked in Germany before the war. Groves wanted to know the names of the most brilliant German physicists the ones most likely to succeed in giving Hitler an atomic bomb. They all agreed on one name, Werner Heisenberg. The position of Heisenberg in German physics is essentially unique, Oppenheimer said. He'd be at the head of any serious German program. The German-born physicist Hans Baeth even had an idea of what to do about it. Kidnapping Heisenberg, said Baeth, would greatly limit the German project. 
Groves considered the idea. Kidnapping was not part of his job description, but he was ready to do whatever it took to win this race. He passed the suggestion on to a fellow general, asking the man to raise the subject with Army Chief of Staff General George Marshall. Marshall's reply came back. Tell Groves to take care of his own dirty work. Groves took careful note of the wording. Marshall didn't want to know about Groves' dirty work. But he didn't tell Groves not to get dirty. This was a job for a new top-secret government agency, the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. Specifically, it was a job for Colonel Carl Eifler. The 37-year-old Eifler already had a reputation for reckless bravery. Wounded by flying metal scraps earlier in the war, he pulled out his pocket knife and dug the steel from his thigh. His idea of fun was to shoot cigarettes out of his friends' mouths. In late 1943, Eifler was working for the OSS somewhere in the jungles of Southeast Asia. Fighting behind Japanese lines, he organized hit-and-run raids on enemy troops. He enjoyed the work and was disappointed to receive a mysterious order. On or about December 9, 1943, you will proceed from India to Headquarters Office of Strategic Services, Washington, D.C., for temporary duty. Eifler flew to Washington, wondering what he could possibly do so far from the action. Soon after arriving, he pulled out a clean uniform over his muscular 250-pound frame and drove to the OSS building. He walked in and was headed toward the director's office when he spotted a man he knew, a young lawyer who'd once dared to criticize Eifler in an official report. Eifler lunged at the small man, seized him by his jacket, and lifted him off the floor and smacked his back against the wall. Eifler leaned in close, glaring into the man's eyes. Listen, you son of a bitch, he growled. If you ever interfere with my activities again, I'll kill you. Eifler set the lawyer down, turned, and walked to his meeting. He was greeted by Major Robert Furman, General Groves' top intelligence officer. What can you tell me about my new assignment? asked Eifler. Without getting into specifics, Furman explained that the United States and Germany were racing to make a new kind of bomb. If Germany won the race, they'd win the war. At this point, said Furman, the most dangerous tool the Germans had had was between the ears of a physicist named Werner Heisenberg. Eifler had no idea who Heisenberg was and didn't ask. Instead, he said, You want me to bump him off? By no means, said Furman. Our purpose is to deny the enemy his brain. Eifler wanted, waited for more. Colonel Eifler, began Furman, do you think you can kidnap this man and bring him to us? When do I start? By God, shouted Furman, banging the table. That's the most refreshing thing I've heard this whole damned war. Several days later, Eifler was back at OSS headquarters, meeting this time with Director General William Donovan and two of his top officers. Carl, said Donovan, this new operation will not even be given a code name. It is one of the biggest items of the war to date. We cannot even tell you much about the men you will be working with. Eifler raised no objection. Colonel Ned Buxton said, Well, Eifler, have you selected a plan? Yes, sir, said Eifler. I have. Buxton gestured for Eifler to continue. I will go in through Switzerland, said Eifler. He explained how he'd sneak across the border into Germany, grab Heisenberg, and drag him back to Switzerland. From there, said Eifler, I'll take him to a certain airport where you will fly him out. Buxton pointed out that the Swiss, who were neutral in the war, would raise a stink at having their territory used this way. Well, he said, they just have to get over it. He agreed to send an army plane to pick up Eifler and Heisenberg and fly them over the open Atlantic Ocean. Once clear of the European coast, said Buxton, you and the scientist will be dropped to one of our submarines, which will take you aboard for a return to the United States. If the timing of the plane and submarine are off, said Eifler, or if the submarine is being chased by German subs, or a hurricane is blowing when we get ready to ditch, what of these possibilities? Buxton and Donovan exchanged glances, smiling. Eifler, said Buxton, you're the last person in the world to be talking of risks. Eifler conceded the point, but he did have one tactical question. I've kidnapped this man and smuggled him safely back to Switzerland, he said. Now, suddenly I'm surrounded by Swiss police and can't get him to the airfield. What are my orders? Very simple, Colonel, said Buxton. 
you are to deny Germany the use of his brain. The only way to do that is to kill him, said Eifler. So I kill him, and the Swiss police arrest me. What then? Then we've never heard of you.